We're here at South Flat Land and Livestock in Worland this afternoon. We're visiting with Vance Lundgren, and he's going to tell us a little bit about some of their practices here on the farm, how they manage their soil, and some of the benefits and challenges of what they're doing. What are your, some of the crops you're growing, and what's your basic um, rotation and soil management practices? Well, our main crop is uh, sugar beet, and um, we also grow seed alfalfa, and we also grow malt barley. And we try to keep the sugar beets out of the fields uh, only every third year. And that seems to be a pretty good rotation for us. And our tillage in the past has been very much moldboard plow. And then probably about seven years ago, we started trying some strip tillage. All of these farms around here are getting larger, so we need to do more tillage or more field preparation in a shorter amount of time. So just the amount of trips and manpower and equipment that it took to do that old conventional tillage was just overbearing. Uh, it's been probably greater than 15 years ago now, but when I first came back, the field man here was big on moldboard plowing. And he said that with sugar beet production, we'll never get away from the moldboard plow. To be honest, it was pretty disheartening. I knew that my ability to expand our acres was limited right there. Are you integrating livestock at all into the rotation? You know, when we were conventionally tilling, we had to uh, take a barley field, for instance, that was going to sugar beets, and we had to take that field and till it up and get it ready, and most of the time it was in the fall. A lot of the barley fields were just tilled up and were bare dirt going into the fall, and, and then we'd get right in them in the spring uh, planting while we were tilling the others. We run a pretty healthy cow calf operation also, and we like to bring those cows down here in the winter and graze the farm fields and, and eat any crop aftermath or residue. So on the barley fields, once they're harvested, we will then go back in and reseed a barley crop right behind that one. And then, because of strip tillage, we didn't have to do that conventional tillage. We were able to grow that crop and then in the spring, the cows have that crop grazed down quite a ways, and we can go in and easily uh, strip till into that residue and, and plant. We graze all of it in the fall, so we're limited to spring strip till. Right. And so far, we've gotten through everything in very good order. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing we've learned through all of this is that that incredible amount of tillage that we thought we had to do for sugar beets is not true. So how long did it take you to transition from um, all conventional tillage over to the strip tillage where you are now? We started on our lighter, sandier fields that were more prone to wind erosion, water erosion, and of course we started where we had center pivot sprinklers. A lot of our heavier ground we, we felt like was probably fine, but sometimes the conventional tillage on heavier grounds was challenging too. So that kind of led us into trying it on some of the heavier fields. The fuel savings alone in those first three years um, was, was pretty huge. It was did, did you see a yield decrease in some of your heavier soils when you started doing, going into strip till initially? We, we suspected that we would, and we were ready to give up a little bit because we were saving all this fuel and man hours, and, but truly we just really never saw any yield decreases. There's a lot of pieces of this puzzle that had to come into this area to make all that work. And, you know, it started with center pivot sprinklers and it was Roundup Ready crops. And then a lot of these seed treats that we have on beet seeds now, and the GPS technology came into play. It all kind of came together and made it all possible. And, and today it seems, you know, it seems pretty simple. But, you know, just looking 10 years ago, we didn't have a lot of those ingredients. You know, strip tillers are fairly expensive. And so, any time you can use them for something else is a plus. And what we've found is with our seed alfalfa, we plant it on 22 inch rows. And so there's a need to kind of open that soil up and get that water in early in the spring and get the crop going again. And so we've found it useful to take our strip tiller and use it to rip the centers of them 22 inch rows. And while we're doing that, we go ahead and put some phosphorus down in that root zone where it really needs it. Have you seen any difference in terms of as your, some of your soil properties changed with using more strip till over several years? Have you noticed how, the, how your water management or irrigation management changes? You plant a sugar beet from three quarters to one inch deep. So you have to keep that area moist 
for an extended period of time until that beats through and a lot of times if you develop a crust you'll have to continue to water to soften that crust and get that cotyledon through. So when you have some residue out there we've noticed that it will hold that ground wetter longer. Just irrigating that crop up is about half the, the trips we would have to make with that sprinkler when there's residue out there versus if we were just watering bare soil. What have been some of the biggest challenges? I mean, were there times where you just sort of had to hold the faith that it was going to get better, that, or everything just pretty much went smoothly from the beginning with the strip till? When we started doing a little bit more minimum tillage, you know, we might try to bury the residue a little bit with a disc or maybe even a field cultivator, and, and then we would drag this homemade strip tiller through it. And so when you're tilling that zone, you know, that zone ends up tilling up maybe close to 10 inches of your 22 inch row. And so you're asking your equipment to ride on that other 12 and it's tough. You know, that, that isn't a very stable foundation for that equipment to ride on. So, so you're able to come in with your strip tiller uh, on a straight row and then because of your GPS, you were able to follow with the planter much more accurately than yes. without the GPS. So we have now gone to implement steering on uh, both our strip tiller and our planter. It's pretty nice to have that confidence there that where you're placing those nutrients with that strip tiller is where you're placing that seed. And then when you come into harvest time too, everything's lined up. We've strip tilled and flat planted beets in some really heavy ground that we've had some difficulties harvesting you have to go in a little bit deeper with those wheels. In this particular year, it got really hard and dry at harvest time, and it was difficult to pull the harvester through there. So some of our really heavy fields will do a minimum tillage where we will incorporate that barley residue a little bit with a disc operation, and our disc has a roller following it. Okay. And we'll do that in the fall. And of course, with our situation, we'll Right behind that will be a regrowth crop, and the cows will eat that off, and then we'll come in in the spring, strip till, and then ridge that whatever's left there up. So the residue in those ridges actually has not been that much of an issue. In fact, I want to believe that it's probably been a benefit in providing an avenue for some of those small beets to come up through. We've got a lot of sandy ground, especially out south of Worland here and we were prone to wind erosion, especially with uh, cotyledon beets where it was horrible. We would lose beets every year. And we've tried to plant some barley ahead of it, but the barley just won't get up and provide a cover enough by the time we're wanting to plant. We struggled to find any alternative to help hold that soil in there. But when we started strip tilling and there was all that residue there, it was amazing. I mean, they, you could sleep every night and you knew you weren't <laughs> gonna lose those beets. And So now you've been doing some soil testing uh, and noticing some changes in your soil in the fields that have had strip till for, a lot, for several years now. What have you been noticing? Well, I think we're on the front end of it, but we definitely are seeing a trend in our organic matter percentage um, upward. So seeing it going up. Yeah. Our area has some soils that are less than 1% organic mm -hmm. matter. It's probably not going to take a whole lot to make some improvements here, you know. So that beet kind of goes down and hits that hard pan at 9 inches, and it seems like he puts a little more energy into developing that within that 9 inches instead of devoting some of his energy in developing that root down there at from 9 to 12 inches like they used to. What's your nutrient management routine on most of the fields? The soil tests on the front end are, you know, a minimum, I would say, for producers, uh, just to find out where you're at, you know, how much you need to put out there, especially with a crop like sugar beets. We'll leave out 20 or 30 units of nitrogen on that front end, and we'll make an assessment when we pull that first petiole. We'll look at what the population of the crop is, the condition of that particular field, and then what that petiole is saying. If that first petiole is calling for something, we will probably put something through the sprinkler. We do use a liquid starter fertilizer where the bulk of our phosphorus is put on. 
Uh, and that is put on with the strip tiller. We have the ability to put that in two different locations if we choose, if we have a lot of phosphorus that it's calling for. In the beginning, we were trying to put some nitrogen down deeper, maybe at that eight inch mm -hmm. level. But we got into some trouble with sugar beets particularly. The beets hit a point where they grew out of the, the nitrate that was in the starter blend, and then they were seeking something else. And a lot of times the irrigation water that we had put on to water the crop up had flushed some of that stuff that we put in the six to eight inch level down towards the bottom of that tillage zone. We have been putting upward of 150 units on dry right over the top of the residue, whatever it is, and then we till it in. And it feels like a lot of that nitrogen ends up going down into this tilled zone. It seems to be the path that it wants to take throughout the year. What advice might you give someone who wanted to start out with strip till? What have you learned you could share? Number one, it was very important that that sugar beet is planted very closely to the starter fertilizer band that we were putting on. The strip tiller was putting the starter fertilizer on and then the planter was coming and planting and sometimes when that planter would get off from where the strip tiller was, you could definitely see the effects or the lack thereof of that starter. As long as they have the nutrients they need in the place that they need them, they can come through a lot of that residue and thrive very well.